Thank you so much. That did set us up really well, just beautifully. Um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see you all. Some of you I know, some of you I am looking forward to getting to know better. My name is Jane Wenger, and I'm a freelance dramaturg. It's sort of like going to an AA meeting. <laughs> I'd like to welcome Howl Round here and welcome everyone out there. I know some of you, and uh, the rest of you, I'll end up getting to know you too through the rest of my freelance career. And, okay, can you hear me now? I'm always afraid of being a little too loud. Um, I live in San Francisco, and I work anywhere they'll have me. I have uh, quite a few jobs here and there that run concurrently, and we'll talk about those later. I'm going to do our introductions with my esteemed entrepreneurs. Hello. Ooh. I want to sing you a little song. I'm just kidding. Um, my name is Nakisa Edamod. I'm a dramaturg, producer, director, and translator based in San Francisco. I specialize in new plays and musicals and I delight in all kinds of collaborations. Um, I'm the former dramaturg and literary manager of San Diego Repertory Theater, San Jose Repertory Theater, and the Wilma Theater in Philadelphia. And now I am the, your executive VP of freelance and the regional VP of Metro Bay Area for LMDA. So thanks for coming to our panel. Hello, um, um, my name is Amy Handelsman. I'm a freelance dramaturg. I um, know Beth actually from when I worked at the Mark Taper Forum, which is now called Center Theater Group with the other two theaters. I freelance now. I was in Los Angeles for 21 years. I started in theater in New York. I went to work in film and television in Los Angeles. I uh, created a department at the Taper, CTG, under the auspices of Showtime to work with playwrights who wanted to get into um, cable television and film. And um, let's see, what else do I do? Um, I'm on the Artistic Council of the Emile. I've consulted for a lot of theater development places. I have carved a little bit of a, of a specialty in playwrights moving into other areas or adapting from other media. Hi, I'm Sean Renee Graham. Um, I'm originally from San Jose, California and made my way east to pursue studies in dramaturgy. Um, I started my career as the literary associate at, at Hartford Stage Company, where I ran uh, some play development programs, um, mostly the Voices Reading Series, which was a free series on Monday night, and sort of got my feet wet with producing, sort of, by, by doing that. Um, then I came to New York solely as a freelancer. Um, and started my own consulting firm, uh, All Creative Rights, which is providing artistic services to individual artists, helping them raise money, helping them market themselves, that kind of thing, and also script development work with, with new writers. I work at uh, the field as the artist services manager in which I spend my days helping all artists from all disciplines lead create, develop sustainable lives for themselves. Uh, I'm the literary director at the Classical Theater of Harlem, and I'm the resident dramaturg at something called the American Slavery Project, which is uh, commissioning African-American writers to respond to slavery in America. Hi, I'm uh, Don Kugler. I'm in Canada. I came very late to dramaturgy and had no formal training in it. I was uh, working on my MA in English Literature and I finished the coursework for the PhD in English Literature in Saskatoon. I got a Canada Council grant to finish my thesis. I bought a van and went to uh, the east coast of Canada because all my friends were going to Vancouver. I. Uh, didn't really work on my thesis, ended up working at a fish plant, uh, went to live with uh, another couple on an island and worked with them for nine years, building a house, and eventually through this whole process, working on a newspaper and fishing, uh, got interested in community theater, and went from community theater to do my MFA in directing at York, 
and coming out of that, started to freelance as both a production uh, a gopher, uh, eventually a production manager and a dramaturg within the theater and then have continued that cycle. Currently, I've uh, landed in Vancouver where I am an uh, uh, instructor in the School for Contemporary Arts at Simon Fraser University. And I freelance as a dramaturg primarily in the development of dance and new plays, uh, but also do production dramaturgy as well. Thank you. I didn't mention that my work is um, specializing in new work only. I've specialized in new work, working with directly with the playwrights or group of collaborators as it's being developed um, since the, pretty much the beginning of my career. I came up in my early years in um, New York. I was the artistic director of a group here called Women's Ensemble. And in San Francisco, I was the artistic director of an organization called the Bay Area Playwrights Foundation. Um, I have a wide range of work that is appealing to me. I work a lot with solo performers. I directed an opera and dramaturged an opera in January that I absolutely love doing. I also really like working with dance theater a lot and spoken word theater. So those are some of the, the longer I'm in the business, the more exciting things seem to fall my way. Um, but I don't think it's by luck. I think it's by making our own luck and creating our own situations by what is appealing to us, what we want to get better at, who we want to spend our time with. And so it's really about also just being able to stay, find a way, we're going to talk today about finding a way to make this business something that can also pay our rent, be able to let us pay off our college loans, and how we can stay in the business that's rewarding as an art to us, but also how, how do we make that happen? So we'll, we'll see what kind of answers we have for you and what kind of answers you might be able to add on to this. So I'm interested in how my fellow panel members got into this field. And you sort of answered that a little bit um, about saying that that wasn't what your intention was from the beginning. So I'm going to pass my mic to Nikisa and say, how did you how did you get into this business? Was it your original intention? And how did you know that you wanted to be a dramaturg? And did you know what that meant? <laughs> yeah. Does this work too? Um, so I had spent a year of study abroad, my junior year in college at UC San Diego in Paris, studying really crazy subjects in uh, French. Um, like semiology, semiology, psychoanalysis, um, film theory, uh, some theater classes, and at the University of Paris 3 at the Sor New Nouvelle Sorbonne. But anyway, I came back to school and I thought, oh, people in Paris live lives of art, and it's okay. <laughs> so I came back and auditioned for an acting class that was too full, and the a uh, teacher did five minute interviews with us and he asked me what I had been doing and I told him about the classes. He said, do you know what a dramaturg is? I said, no. He said, you'd be a very good one, come work for me. And he was the associate artistic director at San Diego Repertory Theater, Todd Salovey, who's still there. <laughs> and so he became my mentor. I was his literary intern. And then I became his dramaturg for the first show he ever directed there. This was back in uh, 92, I think. And so I started my career as a freelance dramaturg while finishing my undergrad degree, then applied to the MFA program and did an MFA in dramaturgy at UC San Diego. And when I graduated, they eventually created a position for me and I was the resident dramaturg and artistic associate. So being at different regional theaters enabled me when I moved to London for a short time that I could start a freelance career. I had made enough connections. And so that's how I'm doing the work now. So that's how I started. <laughs> how did 
I start? Um, I went to a school that I thought had a drama department and didn't, which was Harvard. And uh, maybe they do now, I don't know. Um, so everything that I did was outside of academia. And um, I wanted to work in the entertainment business. That was as specific as I knew. I didn't go to graduate school. Um, somebody gave me good advice and said a good way to learn about what aspect is to work at a large scale talent and literary agency. My first job was on a desk at ICM, and um, I learned a lot there. I freelanced as a story analyst, so I was working for Paramount and Warner Brothers and, and UA and some smaller companies, reading books and going to theater and, and doing coverage, meaning writing about their dramatic possibilities for film or television. I had a terrible breakup with a guy and went to Los Angeles um, and uh, to see if I could work there because all of the story development jobs were there. I paid a lot of dues in Los Angeles. I worked there for 20 years, not realizing that as a story executive or a creative executive or producer, I basically was a dramaturg for those, for film and television. And then I got the perfect job working at a theater but involved with film and television, the taper job. Um, which doesn't, I, it had never existed before. I'm trying to create it to see if it can exist again. I liked what Jamie said about um, the entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, ambition. I grew up, you know, women were still not supposed to be ambitious. You know, I'm that old. But um, the thing is, when w working in Hollywood, I mean, what, what I basically did was work with writers developing material, which is what n new play dramaturgs do. But I also really, really had to learn how to be entrepreneurial within the studio system because, you know, all those jobs, maybe every job in, involves selling, so you have to be able to, to pitch, you have to be able sometimes to figure out how to raise funds, you know, how to market it to an audience, all that sort of thing. So I ended up being, not a reluctant dramaturg, but I ended up sort of backing my way into it from other forms. I didn't think I could make a living in theater. Um, I do now, I do now, but I also think it's, easier when you have sort of hybrid skills. And, and it's appealing to me not just to have my own business, but to actually call it a business, as opposed to, you know, just being put myself up for hire somewhere as an independent contractor, to say this is a business. I think we'll get into it later about, you know, treating yourself as a business. Um, but I think you have to be scrappy still, you know. Um, and I agree, I've, I've given, you know, I think a lot of freelancers have a hard time you know, making a contract for doing a certain amount of work, you love the writer, you love the project, you end up putting in a lot more time and, you know, you end up having financial problems. Thank you very much. Before Sean Renee gets started, could someone go around and pick up those questions off the table for us, please? And um, thank you, Amy, and I really like the idea of continuing to talk about it as a business that really segued with what Jamie said, and we will get back and talk about that some more. Uh, I started out uh, wanting to be an actor, director type <laughs> and as an undergrad. I was at uh, Cal California State University, Los Angeles, and uh, at the end of my um, time there, uh, I ended up taking a criticism class with someone by the name of Susan Mason, <laughs> who um, uh, was very involved with dramaturgy and doing projects um, in that capacity. And uh, I, I started doing the writing assignments and she said, you should be a dramaturg because the way you're talking about this work that you're seeing is so thorough and you know thoughtful um, that um, uh, that's a, the direction I think you should go in. And then she, at the time she was also the uh, editor of Theater Journal and she said, um, I want you to start seeing stuff around town um, and start writing about it, because eventually I want to publish something of yours. And I had just never really thought about it, <laughs> um, honestly. And um, so I ended up writing an article about the Actors Gang <laughs> uh, and their production of Wojciech, and she published that this uh, summer that I, I graduated from Cal State LA. Um, and so then I took an internship at the Mark Taper Forum, the world is so small, uh, with Oliver Mayer and um, Frank, his last name, Dwyer, yeah. Um, and I spent about a year there just reading scripts, um, working on some of the play festivals there, um, and 
Oscar Eustace was there at the time. A lot of different people were going through there. Tony Kushner was writing Angels in America. It was just an amazing time to be um, uh, at that theater. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to, since I was get, gaining so much experience with new play development, that I wanted to um, get more classical training, which I didn't really have. I got the job at Hartford Stage Company, which I, I had mentioned before. But what I found um, while there um, is that a lot of the uh, work that I was doing, uh, reading and, and responding to plays, it wasn't really going any higher than right there in the, that literary office. It was just, you know, that's what you do. Um, you would be a part of an, an, ar uh, an artistic meeting and, and they would say, well, what plays do you have on your plate? And you'd be really excited about it and they'd go, that's great! And then you would just sit there, which for me led to a lot of frustration eventually, of course. It would for anybody. Um, and that, that's kind of when I decided, when I left there, that's when I decided that freelance work was going to be the way for me to go because I could control what projects I was working on and, and the, how much time I put into it and um, also really contribute to, to uh, an artistic process in a meaningful way. You know, people really wanted you there, that's what you did. But what I also found is that it's hard to make, make a living that way. And so what I started doing was um, using uh, my other skills, writing skills, um, uh, what I knew about producing and those kinds of things to help other artists get their, their stuff seen and, and done. Um, because what I found was that led me to eventually becoming the dramaturg anyway, because I could be, in, in all those roles, I, I could be the best champion for the work alongside side the artist. And so, yeah, I'll stop there, I guess. Okay. Uh, while I was doing my MFA in directing, um, I, I proposed to direct as my thesis project uh, my uh, fellow playwright in the, the thesis program. MFA program, and uh, our, uh, the director's advisor uh, was Richard Rose from the Nessa Angel Company, and it's the company I had been scouting out all the theaters in Toronto, and, and that was the theater that most interested me, and he just happened to be uh, the advisor for the directors, and he advised me strongly against uh, doing the, uh, directing the play of the playwright uh, in the MFA program, and um, I said, well, I don't know, I think it's not where it needs to be, but I think it can get there. Like, I think it, it can go. And he said, no, you should really do a uh, play because this is what you want to do. And I said, no, I'm going to stick with this. And then he came to see it, and he said, uh, was that the same play? And I said, yeah, it was. And he said, oh, you might be good at this. And shortly after that, uh, I, I was uh, working as a production dramaturg at Toronto Free Theatre, and freelancing as a, uh, a dramaturg at Necessary Angel, so working with him and reading scripts. And it's a very good collaborative relationship because there was a huge pile of scripts there that which had never been read and been submitted to the company, so I worked my way through all those, uh, writing up reports and having discussions with him, trying to clarify the mission of the company with him. And uh, the, the plays that I really brought forward to him that I thought were, uh, were terrific, we could have discussions about, and then he and I would go meet those people. But sometimes he would not be interested, and then I'd say, well, is it okay if I go and meet with those people? And so I would go off and meet with those. And so I was creating a whole uh, a, a range of a connection with writers with whom I wanted to work, even if the company didn't work, want to work with them. And so that s slowly evolved over time, that relationship with that company. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, I guess the next step is like within uh, a few years, like three years, in 1989, I went to my first dramaturgy conference in San Francisco. And when I came back, I said to him, I think that's what I am. Thank you. Um, I had an early love affair with playwrights and uh, from college, and I don't have my MFA either. I don't have a graduate degree. And I moved to New York. I'm from Michigan originally. 
and I moved to New York and did that New York thing, came alone, came up on the subway. I'll never forget it. There was a strike for Nathan's, and they were all standing around saying, don't eat at Nathan's till they hire back the workers. And uh, it, it was just indelible in my mind. I had done summer stock theater. I came up and stayed with friends who were playwrights. The summer stock theater in Michigan had a program where they had young writers writing, young being college age people writing. And so from the minute I was in this group with these writers, I just loved being part of this new development process. I did my internship at the Roundabout. I was at the Roundabout for a long time. And from there, I started this circle. It actually had been started, Women's Ensemble, but it was sort of on its way out. And in terms of ambition, what that gave me was a circle of women writers who were creating new work. In, uh, we worked out of what's called the Ellington Room at Manhattan Plaza, which was a live work building for artists so they could sustain themselves at the level that they earned. So that was also really eye-opening to me to see that Liza Minnelli had the penthouse, but people that were on my level at the time of income were living in these great studio apartments. I have friends that still live in those same studio apartments then. And we met, which I look at it now, I don't know how we did it, but we met once a week. And everyone read their work. And by default, I became a dramaturg. And it was just amazing. And I also had this opportunity from that to learn about the different aspects of producing and putting on a show. And I also learned the same thing from the roundabout at that time. When I was hired there, we were building. I learned to read blueprints there. I'm a firm believer that it's really important to learn every aspect of theater that you possibly can. My ability to read blueprints changed my life in terms of working with a set designer as a collaborator early in the dramaturgical process of developing work, of starting pre-rehearsal work. And so I think there's so much, if you're curious and if you're ambitious, that can, can help you build these careers. And these people that you meet, you just really never know when you're going to run into them again. So I just think that the people that you meet are so important and what kind of plays you like and what kind of plays you're drawn to will then also bring you to what kind of work you love to do. Um, I have recently done, we're going to talk about our dream projects a little bit, but when you start working in a certain field and you fall in love with it, then projects in that area come to you. I've been working with a lot of what would be probably called activist work or social activism but I didn't start out like that. But the last six or seven years have been, that's been my focus. And that's also kept me always learning something different. Now I know more about the Esalen Indians than I ever thought I would know. But the great thing about dramaturgy, right? It's like we never stop going to school. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a couple of these questions and uh, just pass some of these down. And Nikisa, if you would read the first one. No, just, yeah, if, sure. This one's a good one. Okay. What is your, there it is. Here you go. What is your dramaturgical superpower? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there, there, there you go. You have to answer now. Oh, I answer? Okay, let's see. Now see if Nikisa can't answer this. I know, this is in my real house. Um, uh, and this is why we're doing this. Dramaturgs, we all have to think okay. fast. I'm not sure uh, <laughs> what her superpower is, but I know she's a great listener. Oh, that's a nice one. I was gonna say, um, 
I fly in my dreams, and I have a lot of adventure dreams ever since I was little, so I do think I'm a superhero by night. But, so I think it's uh, helping people soar, soar to new heights, and finding their true potential and bringing it to the surface, and fighting for it. We let your voice be heard, playwrights and dramaturgs and theater artists. I was thinking of these questions, so I'm going to yeah, pass on this. Does oh. anyone else have a superpower that they want to share? Sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> My superpower is finding the money. Oh. Oh. That's a great because, and I say that because, like, I feel like we can wax poetic about all of what we like to do and and what kind of work we're drawn to and and all of that, which is great. It is, that is a skill you should have. Which leads me to my uh, question here is, you know, how do you determine the value of your work and compensation and, and, and all of that? Um, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, r recently, uh, my, my, my work with the Classical Theater of Har Harlem is, is largely about consulting. It's not, I'm, I'm, it's not like I have a literary office there or whatever. It's like Ty Jones came to me and said, would you take over these reading programs? Would you occasionally dramaturg a production? Blah, 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 you know. So uh, I said, sure, you know, uh, you know, what, let, 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 that, that's always the first thing I, I say, because I have to live. I say, <laughs> what are you offering, right? And I got to see a letter of agreement, and I can tell you all of what I can do and everything, but what are you expecting, and what are you expecting to pay for that? And there's always a negotiation. There always is. Um, and so what I, I treat that kind of work like is, is going on a retainer, a monthly retainer, at a certain amount of money that covers a certain amount of my expenses, <laughs> depending on what they are. So um, if you're talking about running a reading series, a monthly, um, um, facilitating something like that for someone. Um, right now, my rate to do that is $600 a month, right? Is that a number? A number, a number, right? I have other income that I'm getting, so in order to just pick a play, talk with that playwright, call and get the space, be there for the reading and the rehearsal on that day, that's what that costs, because I got to read a few other plays to make my decision about that, right? Um, as far as doing one-on-one -on -one, um, script coverage with people, say, in, like in my, um, in my shop, uh, if people want me to read their play and give them feedback on it, I have three different levels of doing that. If you just want me to read the play and give you one page of general notes, it's $150. If you want me to read the play and give you a more extensive report on it, it's $250. <laughs> If you want to then talk about it, then there's add-ons for the consultation. If you want to talk on the phone, that's another $50. If you want to have lunch with me, that's another $50. You have a menu. <laughs> yeah, I have a menu. This is so, this is so great. And I get it. And I get it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to move over. I do. You want me to? No. Um, but I just want to say one more thing here. And the person asked about increases per year. Uh, on my retainer work, yes, I go up twenty-five dollars a year I on the month I see for a the lot month. Of people please. nodding their yeah. heads. So I'm just interested in a show of hands. How many of you are interested and concerned about how to earn as a freelancer? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. That's yeah, what. Great. So we want to we want to keep up on this part of the business conversation for a little while. Mm -hmm. And so let's stick with this that. This question is about that. So Both I of these are questions. Okay, good, good. Great. <laughs> so. Oh, so that, that was the original story, actually. Um, uh, someone wanted me to dramaturg a whole production, a whole classical production. Uh, rehearsals, cutting the script. Uh, providing information to the actors and all of that, and then proceeded to tell me, um, we have about $500 in the budget for that. At which point I said, I get what the designers get for that kind of work, right? And I got it. So I'm also saying it to say, like really think about the scope of all of the work 
Um, and no one to say no. Because to do that kind of the work that I was being asked to do for $500 is ridiculous. Um, uh, 2000 Yeah, or 3000 Can I just Can I just piggyback on that one thing in terms of rate? Because I, you have to not be afraid to negotiate. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm developing a website. It's in beta now. I was told not to put my rates on. On the other hand, at least it's straightforward if you put your rates on. So that's a question I want to talk to you about. But the thing is that also you have to think not just in terms of the time, but laying out of the timeline. Because I negotiated for a project recently. I negotiated an extra meeting. It was supposed to be three meetings. The husband who was her manager said, can we please have four? But the way that she worked, what I didn't realize was not, you know, I'll read a script. I read a script for flow. Then I read a script and take notes. But I don't take notes the first reading. I read it for flow. OK, so there's that. And I'm a fast reader. But between the times when I was meeting with her, I had to refresh myself of the original draft, the subsequent drafts. So it ended up being a lot more time consuming, which I'm going to factor in now, you know? Um, I don't think people want to pay by the hour. My hourly rate would be much more. I don't know how you figure out, you know, the poor starving artist from, you know, the lesser starving artist from, you know, the institution from the bigger institution. You know, I want to talk to you more about that and my fellow colleagues about that. But, you know, there are factors in placing your rate that come into play that are always new for me. And you can always, I just want to say about that, you can always do a sliding scale depending on where the artists are, as long as you're honest about them about what they're going to get for that amount of money. Right? right? Yeah, I do sliding scale a lot. And also I like what you said about learning, um, uh, learning from the experience of reading. And then I don't take notes on the first read either. I do what I call a close read. Then I take notes. I explain this to my clients, writers. And I, I just think what you're saying about setting fees and being clear and being clear from the beginning. And then sometimes you just don't have a certain person who works with you, although I do recommend to people some other folks that I know who I know will work for less. And that's not because they're like not as good. They might be younger. You might have a different rate when you start. I have a different rate now than I had before. And I do also have a sliding scale too. But I never, it sounds kind of bitchy, but I don't read plays for free. Nope. Because I don't have that kind of time. And so if you're a playwright who I'm just in love with, and I ask you if I can read your script, then I'm reading it for free. But in terms of, you know, when so many people ask you to read a play and, for free and you, you simply have to have the courage to explain to them, should you choose to do it that way, that it's not for free. They wouldn't ask you to do whatever their job is for free either. So I think that's great. Let's continue with this. Yeah, just uh, I'll probably have some contrary opinions on this. Uh, one thing Please. I do uh, is uh, I ask to see the budget. Like, what's the budget? Like, what are other people? What are other people getting? Like, I just want to see where where does this fall in the budget? And you maybe maybe you don't have any money. If you don't have any money, and everybody's committed to the project, and I'm committed to the project, okay, well, let's go ahead. Let's do it. Right? I'm keen on it. You're, I'm as keen as you, and I'm willing to put in as much sweat equity as you. But if uh, some people are getting paid a lot, and other people are getting paid a little, then let's let's talk about where we fall in that scale. Uh, there's another uh, variable for me, which is uh, sometimes, uh, actually quite often, and uh, probably more often in dance than in theater, people ask me to work with them as a dramaturg. And I say, what do you think that means? And they describe something, and I say, well, yeah, I could probably do that. Uh, it's not, I'm not very interested in that. Uh, but why don't I come to your rehearsal and watch a performance, and then I'll come and I'll talk to you afterwards. And if my talking with you seems useful, then let's continue a discussion. And sometimes I say, let's, let's set the rate at the end of the project, because I don't know yet how much I'm going to be involved in this project. And if you're willing to wait, I'm willing to wait. Because I, I can't predict now 
where this project is going to go. And I do read scripts for free, not everything, but uh, I, like, I like to know what's out there. So I read a lot of scripts just because I'm curious. I want to know what's out there. And I say good for you, and what's really great is to have a variety of different models of working because all we're doing is sharing what we do with you, and I don't think there's a right way. Amy? Amy has the right way. No, I don't have a right way. I don't have a right way, but, but, but I, my stomach clench, clenched when you said you did the work and then negotiated the fee. I mean, I actually have, have, have now said to somebody before I'm going over and talking to them, before we start talking, this is the next payment that you owe me, you know? And it's been extremely hard for me to do that, but I have done that, you know? I've certainly done things for love, you know, I read scripts at these more established institutions for love. One, because they have a better quality of playwright sometimes, because I want to be associated with them. You have to know why you're doing stuff, too. I have a hard time now. A lot of people in my life are grandfathered in. I have a lot of writer mm -hmm. friends, you know, and I just, I just can't bring myself to say, you know, you have to give me some money. I just haven't been able to yeah. do it. I mean, I have when I've actually worked really, really in the nuts and bolts of developing the property, but to read something. No, I can't do that. Yeah. Um, this, is, this question is all its related. I'm worried about two things, insurance and financial stress. Can't read that word, but uh, <laughs> any advice for a budding freelancer? In uh, the early career dramaturg panel, someone also said, what other jobs can I do for money to sustain me while I go on and do this work? Uh, try to get my artistic job. So I came up with a few. I mean, dramaturgs have so many varied skills that we're really good at certain things. So uh, I think we could be good museum or art gallery curators. I think we'd be good copy editors or proofreaders for magazines, online publications, any publications. Um, what else did I come up with? A salesman of any kind, even retail sales. If you love records, selling records, at least it's using your skills. So you may enjoy that kind of thing. A librarian, a research librarian, an information booth attendant <laughs> of something. I think we'd be really good at trivia and research that way. Um, we're very good at producing. We're good at event planners, event coordinators. Um, publications or marketing assistant, um, advertising. Uh, so I don't know, I'd also say to, to all of us, what skills are you good at? What are you the, what do you do in your family life that they, people go to you for that? Do you do all the taxes every year? Do you, you know, what, and what skills do you enjoy doing? And maybe there's a job out there for you that you can do the nice thing with the 10 to five job, nine to five job, or a part-time job is that if it's not something you adore, you'll leave it at that closing time. And then you'll have time for rehearsal or talking to your playwright or doing your dramaturgy. I just want to say that what's been a big part of my trajectory is um, with other artists' projects is, like I was saying, doing things for them that will help the project along and at the same time practice my dramaturgy. And usually what that involves is, you know, people um, again, need to find the money. So doing things like grant research and writing and, and actually doing those grant applications, you know, for, for the artist, um, writing marketing materials, writing press releases, um, doing the social media part of it. Um, along those lines, what um, I also learned is a lot about individual giving and fundraising and helping and counseling artists do that, which led me to the job I have now at the field um, in artist services, which is what I do all day long. Um, artists call up with, with various issues that they have. Um, they need their grant applications reviewed. They need their budgets looked at. Um, they need to run a crowdfunding campaign. How do you do that? How do you sustain that? Um, and so I, I think that part of getting to the point where you're practicing dramaturgy, or at least the way it's happened for me all the time now, has been using those skills for people. Um, because eventually they will come back to you and say, oh, and oh yeah, <laughs> um, rehearsals start on such and such a date. 
So um, in terms of making a living, I've been known to collect in various line items on the, the budget um, in addition to the Trump dirty work. Um, and I think if you figure out how to do that and figure out what works best for you, whether that's just say you're just going to do all the grant applications or say you're just going to do all the social media work or, or whatever, that you can, you, you know, you can um, also, you know, build a lasting relationship with that, that artist that keeps bringing you back to, to their projects over and over again. Um, I, th I found other jobs w within the theater, like uh, I did a lot of production work and then eventually production management work. Uh, but also uh, uh, university gigs, uh, just coming in and teaching a sessional course, something like that, have been really uh, important along the line for me. Uh, often allowed me to uh, think about uh, plays, often even teach plays that I was interested in. Um, and it's just a relationship to uh, an institution and a, a set of faculty. And it moved me across uh, the space, uh, the country, a relationship with different uh, play development organizations. While I was in Toronto, I had a relationship with the Saskatchewan Play, De play Development Center. So I held, uh, built relationships up there. So eventually, my community, I, tr I tried as much as possible to get out of the, uh, the ghetto of Toronto so that my community, I started to think of my community as all of Canada and tried to find working relationships all across the country so that I could access uh, those possibilities. I wanted to piggyback on something that both of you said. Um, one, I'm getting an MFA now, actually not in dramaturgy, but in writing, because I also, I also write, and I have found with friends of mine that run departments, and I would say, look, I could probably teach dramaturgy. Do I have to get an MFA? And they said, well, yeah, and I said, why? And they said, because if you're teaching your MFA student, you're supposed to have that level of degree. So you have a PhD, Other, you don't. Anyway, I don't have a graduate degree at all, so I can't even be an adjunct. I mean, is that competitive? an adjunct for $5,000 at best a semester. Um, I took a job, a day job, as the executive director of a dance company, which I dearly love. But being the executive director, talk about staying up nights worrying about payroll. You know, So I thought, I can do this part time. It'll balance my career as a dramaturg. I think you also have to do a cost benefit analysis of where your energy is, what, you know, how much you're thinking about things when you're not actually at the job. And also, it's interesting, Sean Renee, what you were talking about, because even though I'm a really good dramaturg, on our productions, we have a dramaturg who's fantastic. But I am put in the business role now, not in the creative role, which I find astonishing, because I think of myself as a creative. I actually feel I'm pretty balanced and can do both. But I have found I couldn't switch hats in the same company. Um, I, I wanted to respond to one question. Do you advertise yourself using dramaturg as a title, or do you call yourself something else for the sake of easier marketing, which I'm facing now with this website. I am calling myself a story consultant because I've worked and I'm, I'm marketing myself as, as working in film, television, and theater. People do know what dramaturg is in theater, and they respect it. Sometimes I use the E at the end, sometimes I don't. Um, sometimes I've thought it should be a creative consultant, but is that vague? Sometimes I thought it should be a producer, but I think that, that raises the level of expectation. Um, somebody wrote an article about me in Dramatist Magazine and called me a creative midwife, which I've used on the website. Somebody said to me, you should use that as a title. You should actually, I don't know if you can trademark or market or whatever, you can get the domain name. And I said, some people think that's really wonderful because I'm helping give birth to plays. Other people um, have said, midwife, ooh, that's like, Birkenstocks and, you know, hippie and... Just use it in California. Yeah, so, but it's a good question. I think dramaturg and theater is fine. In other fields, it's, people don't know what it is. Um, in general, I call myself a creative consultant, but um, in my mind, I always call myself a dramaturg because I think there's something psychologically helpful about that in, in knowing that that's, that's always what I want to pursue and that's actually the... This, the real service I want to provide to people, yeah. I just wanted to share my personal business card. You will never see this, but it is the pronunciation of the word dramaturg, and it's spe spelled like a dictionary definition. And it says, it has the name, the, dr the syllables, the <laughs> pronunciation, then it says noun, number one, and no definition. 
so people have to ask me what it is. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I always call, for 20 years I've called myself the midwife in the birthing of a play, and I had to, I ended up now on the back of my resume, I have a page that's called What is a Dramaturg? And I first wrote it for my mother-in-law because she wanted to explain it to her friends what her daughter-in-law does, <laughs> she didn't know. So it's trying to be basic. It has synonyms for dramaturg and a basic definition and then a little list that's more detailed of all the different things I do, dramaturgs do. And um, it's on the back of my bio, my resume, whenever I send it out, or, or my bio. And um, so, I, you know, I want to someday live in a world where people know what it is, people know how to say it, that they don't spell it with an E at the end, because that's dramaturge is a playwright in the French language with the E at the end. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, I'm going on tangents. Go ahead. No, thank you. <laughs> um, I want to keep to your questions. We have about 20 minutes left, and so we want to keep you engaged. And I also want to mention that questions that you didn't get answered or thoughts that you have for the rest of the conference, please come up to the people on this panel and engage them with those questions and, and tell them what's on your mind, too. Um, raising money, I do not teach at a college, but also I do have enough friends who teach at colleges that have me come in and run um, at San Francisco State. I do what's called a master class in dramaturgy um, at University of Illinois as well. And so a couple of times a year, those things help and those things are also in the budget. I think one thing you have to be prepared for and good at is juggling jobs. And I don't really think too many people are very good at multitasking. I don't believe you can read your email and think about it while you're crossing the street. But you do have to negotiate several different jobs. If you're going to take a job, in my case, with a theater that's an established theater and go in for one gig, six week job, um, five week job, then my other clients have to go by the wayside. Do I lose them? How do you work with that? So there's just, a, I love it. I love it. I feel so fortunate to be able to have the relationships with playwrights. I feel fortunate to be able to travel. I like traveling a little bit less than I did before, but I, I feel really fortunate, but definitely juggling. So. Um, any questions here that you guys have that you want to answer? Great. And then I, I do want to ask the, my fellow panel members to, before we wrap up, about a dream job of theirs, a dream dramaturgy job. So I want to just keep us uh, to finish with that. Well, one question that I have, which has just come into my life now, I was always single and now I'm engaged. And the question is, seeing as more of us can get married now. Whoop. What advice would you give to a married freelancer with regards to making a family and a travel-heavy career job? I don't have children, so that's a huge thing that I don't have. I've had to negotiate with my partner about travel and even time away at night. I think the people that I know that have children have great partners. Um, sometimes they take institutional jobs so that you know they can come home at night and and do less travel. Um, but I think it's. It's a negotiation with the partner. I don't know anyone who's a single parent and is a dramaturg. Um, maybe you guys have children and can answer this. I don't think I do. I don't, don't think, think you have children? children? I don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 this work-life balance when you have a profession where there's travel and a lot of night work, I think, is, is negotiation by negotiation with the partner and having a really, really strong bond. Um, I don't, I know a lot of us without children, and I don't know any single parents. Yeah. Um, questions here that you have in your hand? Since we're very good, we'll probably get this too. Okay, great. <coughs> Do you, any of you have a burning question you need answered right now? Ask it. Yes. Um, so when you're ready to, your question is, do you want to give him the mic? <laughs> yes, thank you. How you transition. 
transition to software and freeware up here? Yeah, it was basically when do you know when to transition from work for experience to work for pay? How do you know that you're going to be worth it? How do you know you have enough value built in that you can ask for the money that you need? I mean, if you're feeling that way, you're probably ready, yeah. right? You've got right that now. impulse. That means you've learned stuff, and now you want to do stuff, right? That's part of that impulse you're feeling. I would say when you're starting to build up a resentment. <laughs> I would say always ask for something from the beginning. That's what I'll say. I, I, I don't think you sh I, th I think we often, as artists, get in the habit of doing stuff for free um, because we want experience or we feel like people will value what it is we have to offer or, or whatever. Um, I think it goes back to um, also, like um, he was saying, look, looking at the budget and saying, what do you have? Um, I'm a big advocate for the, the, for the work that you're doing to always place a value on it yourself first. Um, and then say, what, 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 what have you budgeted for this? Um, I need to get something. And then start increasing it from there. Because if you start out that way, chances are you're going to end up that way more often than you want to. And let's just be honest, the rent has to be paid. And you have to eat. And um, the, the accepting nothing is what makes us crazy. Right? It makes us crazy, and then we can't actually um, contribute to the work that, it, it, that we need to in order to, to make it better. And so, yeah, don't go hungry. Just say, you know, for this amount of work, this is, this is what I can afford to do for you, is what you want to say. I, uh, I always advise the students, uh, n never say no for them. Never say no for them. In other words, Ask. It, make them say no. Sometimes it's very hard for people to say no to you, especially if you're in the room looking face to face. Uh, and uh, Make them say no. And even s them saying no may start a conversation and may lead to something else, may lead to something fruitful. But if you say they probably will say no, so I won't ask, then you've gone nowhere. Thank you. Any people? I'd also like to say as you transition and start asking for money, be realistic with your level of expertise and experience, and you can start, you can be a little bit of a bargain initially, and as you get more work or repeat clients, then you can start raising your fee. And once you prove your value to someone, they'll start to say, okay, you deserve a little raise, <laughs> you know, and then you start to get a reputation, and um, it, it'll soon become a career. Um, thank you for those great questions. I'm so glad that we got to a lot of them. I want to say that at the general meeting, I think that Scott Horstein and uh, Brian Court are going to talk about contracts. I know that there was contracts as an issue. I sent a lot of blank documents to them over the last six months that I just whited out my fees and who it was for, but a, a lot of different samples, samples with just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, also, we want to protect the playwright. I don't, I don't ask for the right of first refusal for my clients if their show is going to go into production and I know it and I must be associated with it, then we have to have that discussion. Um, but I want to protect them as much as me. That's a whole range of discussion to be aware of. Are you only doing it because you want to go do it at you know X or Y, Z theater? Are you prepared to do it as a short-term job? Just what are your expectations? What do you expect from that? So I think keep that in mind, too. So we have just a few minutes about Oh. Well, we have longer than that, so we'll just tell longer anecdotes. Can I answer one or two? Oh, yeah, I'd rather answer your questions than anything. Tips for a business plan. Uh, so I've read recently that they're becoming passe. I don't know if they're becoming passe or not for me. I've written them and I have found for me and helped other people. I, I just find it's just an exercise even if you don't use it to clarify thinking a lot. 
So, I mean, the thing that I like to cover, of course, is how much is this going to cost for me to launch and what's my overhead? You know, you have to think, obviously, about pricing, which we talked about a little bit. But really, how are you defining yourself in the market and how are you different than somebody who's, who's out there? Because, you know, you could say, well, I'm better, but they don't know that. You know, so I think some of it is just uh, a marketing question of how you're presenting yourself to the world who else is out there. Some of it's just information gathering. When I was doing my website, I looked at a lot of other people's websites, which helped clarify to me what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, I don't have a business plan. I was going to ask you uh, a question, though, that's, uh, I guess, somewhat related. No, I don't have a business plan, except for in my head. But I, d I do know how much money I have to make every year and every month. and. I have to work on things. I, I will say it seems like a luxury, but don't take jobs you don't like. Because if you don't like the writing, it's going to, don't even put yourself in that play right through it. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. It's going to be a bad situation. Um, I wanted to ask you about cutting your losses. I think that Amy, you had mentioned that a little bit, and we're, so my, my question to Amy is when, when do you know? that perhaps this is a job you shouldn't take, or how do you get out of it, or, or uh, Amy mentioned it to me earlier, so. Well, I just had one experience with it recently where it, the job didn't even be, I didn't have to leave the job. The job was presented, but we had meeting after meeting after meeting, and I realized there was no job. So at a certain point, I basically said, I'm not sure that we should meet again. You know, I would love to work with you. And I did, and I meant it. It wasn't, you know, in order to manipulate. I said, I'd love to work with you on this project. But, um, you know, this was actually a, a, a dance theater piece where she had an obligation to New York Live Arts to put on something in the season. And I, she just was overcommitted. She wanted to do a film project that was sort of moving from dance to film. and. She knew that I had that area of expertise. We had four or five meetings, which was maybe two or three too many, and I realized there was no job. But I haven't had the experience of actually having to either fire somebody or, you know, have a big blow up or, you know, some catastrophe. I think sometimes they just go away. You know, this is true in the university system too. I have a relationship with a university um, that's doing a project with their students. Uh, I won't say the university, but the project is very interesting. It's about Edward Snowden. I do a lot of Skype work, by the way, or in Google Hangout work. That's another thing for you to be aware of. I'm sure that you are, but the money is the same if I'm in front of you or on the other side of the country. So I, I use that quite a bit. It also works great for collaborative discussions with the dramaturg. So uh, if you do do that, please always test it first. Nothing annoys me more that uh, Skyping into a meeting that hasn't been tested first and then talk about our time. Our time is wasted 15 and 20 minutes when it doesn't start. But um, the university was doing a uh, devised long-term project about Edward Snowden and I had four really long Skype meetings with them. And it was clear to me that this project was maybe going to be in 2017. And so I just talked to the head of the drama department and excused myself and told them that please get back to me when they were a little bit farther along. I wanted to do it and I could feel that I was going to keep logging back onto the Skype meetings or circle jerks. So uh, sometimes you really just have to. Yes. Hi, my name is Martine, for those of you who have not met me yet. So uh, I'm going to take something that's been happening on Twitter and bring it out to you guys um, about the conversation we've been having. So one of the things that came up online was, uh, what do you do in the instance when, for example, a theater, you say something like, I don't, I'm not going to work on this because you're not meeting the, the money that I need, and then they decide, okay, well, then we just won't have dramaturgs done. And, the, and then they, they kind of then become weird about the relationship with dramaturgs to the point where they don't have them 
anymore at all. And then, and the reason why this conversation was coming up is because um, in the area, for example, that I live in, there are very few theaters that employ dramaturgs to begin with. So then when that happens, maybe not saying that it happened, maybe saying that it did, but in that case, then now there's yet another theater that won't hire us. So what advice would you have? I'm gonna pass the mic. <laughs> I don't have any experience in that area because I, I, I work less with theaters and more with individuals. Uh, I've worked, haven't worked um, with an institution in many, many years, which is the reason why I created my own <laughs> business in the first place. Um, I, I just found a new community. Um, it's, I don't know, it's the saying goes, when one door closes, another one opens. And it's, you know, that's cliche, but um, that's what I ended up doing. I, I actually have another comment, which is that I know some pla there's a tension in some places with dramaturgs, there's a tension with some directors with dramaturgs and institutionally. And I know a very, very well-known dramaturg who's at a very, very well-established well um, place. And some of the writers, he's in a festival, and some of the writers that he works with just don't want him in the room, you know? He's maintained the relationship with the institution that respects his work. And um, I think that there are different levels of, of participation when you're dealing institutionally, as opposed to just one-on-one. -on -one. And I think sometimes you have to be willing to say, you know what, I really want my voice to be heard. I'm an advocate for the play, you can firmly believe that. And if they're not respectful, as long as you know, you're still involved and you make a peace with it, you can maintain that or not work there. This is breaking, breaking me a little bit. So you're saying that, I'm like, what? So you're saying that the theater now doesn't want to work with dramaturgs and they're putting a stop to hiring them? What do we do or what advice? I go knock on the door and set up a meeting, whatever kind of bribery that takes, have a coffee, bring, it, bring coffee with me, something or other. That, that kills me a little bit. Like, uh, that's because you haven't worked with the right dramaturg, maybe, or it wasn't the right personality combination, or uh, the project wasn't quite ready for one, or something like that. Like, I, that makes me want to educate. <laughs> and try again, knock on the door in a more subtle way and, um, you know, say, hey, well, what don't you like about it? What, what's scaring you? <laughs> like, have a, have a frank conversation about it. Oh, it's just financial. So for every role, the theater wasn't paying well? Or just for dramaturgs? So I'd go to, oh, do you have assistant directors? Do you have administrative assistants? Like the things they pay for that's less than the high paying jobs and try to say, well, this is what we do. <laughs> it's pretty equivalent to that job you're paying for. Maybe that's another way. And there's a, there's a conversation, it's educational, but you can have a conversation, you just bring in the guidelines and have a conversation around the guidelines and say, here is a, a kind of range of roles, and here's a kind of range of activities, and here's a range of, 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 of prices. And for the, for the people on HowlRound, just to be clear that those are the LMDA guidelines? LMDA guidelines. LMDA, employment guidelines, LMDA.org. Yeah, I'm more black belt about it, you know. I mean, if they really are of the disposition that that has no value, I would say, you know what, they're, you know, it's like when you're dating, next, you know? I mean, I don't know, I don't know if they're living in a place where there is enough work for that person, you know, should they move to Chicago, should they move to New York, I mean, well, New York is crazy, but, you know, I, I don't know that I could be so persuasive if that attitude is, is seemingly so narrow. Um, this is the first time in my career that uh, this year that I uh, took my name off of a play or a project and had a unsuccessful collaboration. I was wondering if you had any thoughts. I've had them. Uh, unsuccessful. I mean, no. I mean, I think that I, I think that we've probably all experienced dramaturgs have had 
unsuccessful maybe collaborations in the past. So um, your 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 question is or your comment is that you had a you took your name off the program as a dramaturg. And how did that make you feel? <laughs> I see. So I'm sorry that happened to you. I've never taken my name off a project before, and I, I, I'm going to make an assumption that what you learned from that terrible experience, that it's never going to happen to you again. Right? Yeah, anything else trending on Twitter that we, that we can answer? Hi, uh, Simon from the Spiderweb Show, and uh, I'm, I'm into the Twitter sphere over here. And I have a question from uh, Coriana Moffat, who wanted to know if you guys uh, have any thoughts about health care for freelancers. Health care for freelancers. So are there health care options for freelance there's COBRA when you quit a job. I don't know. Are there independent entities? You know, th I thank, you know, our president. I mean, it's, it's different. It's different now. But um, for me, um, stupidly, I've gone without. I've tried Freelancers Union. I've tried, you know, I also write, so I've tried Media Bistro. I've tried other organizations that have health care. I don't think there's ever been a time where it's been more realistic to be able to get affordable care since the Affordable Care Act. I mean, when I've been at institutions, it's come with the job, but I've been plenty of places where I haven't had that offer. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say, finding um, membership organizations um, that partner with insurance companies, but yeah, the health exchanges now and the subsidies sh uh, sh could be pretty helpful if you just look into that. Um, and then there, you know, there are different, I don't know, you know, whereabouts in the country the person is, but, uh, you know, there are low-cost services that here, like the Ryan Health Center or the NYU has a program that I know a lot of actors use. It, it's, it's not, well, it's probably no more or less convenient than your average doctor's appointment. There's a wait and, <laughs> you know, but eventually you will see someone. Uh, for uh, sliding scale costs. So I would just look for programs like that in whatever area you're in. Yeah. It is better for us now. I, I pay for my own. That's, that's part of the rub. And then if anybody's interested, uh, Canada has universal health care. <laughs> All right. We've got an answer to that question, and then we'll get to this question. Oh, I just want to say quickly about the Affordable Care Act. It's really important, too, to talk to your fellow colleagues and to find out which plans are working well and which plans aren't. So start a community. Start talking about which doctors are taking which care um, for women, too. Like, you know, which, you know, like Planned Parenthood is amazing and, not, and, and does full-on health services. So, like, but really talk to your community and use them and find the forums to, to see which health programs are working. And Thank you. I think it's such an important part of uh, the aspect of being a freelance career person. And you had an answer over here. And then we're going to move to um, asking our panel to just tell us uh, one short dream job of theirs. Um, that's how I'd like to wrap up with hearing about just something that was a career highlight. But this just uh, so under this duress, um, I found out if you sign up at a university for a c one course and pay the tuition and the health insurance, given that if it's a large insure, insured pool, as it was in this case, it came out to half the cost of comparable health insurance, and they could choose any doctor. Thank you. This has been a great exchange. Thank you for being so engaged. We're not wrapping up, but I just want to say thank you very much for your attention and, and being this engaged. Um, long-term ongoing projects is something that I personally love. Not only long-term relationships with playwrights that are dear to me, but um, I have a couple of projects. One in specific, uh, I have worked with a fellow called Deke Weaver for a long, long time, 
and he has a project called uh, An Unreliable Bestiary, and he's going to do it for the rest of his life, which means I get to be part of that project as his dramaturg uh, for a career, you know, a career project like that. And that is a really exciting thing for me, is to develop long-term relationships. So, Didi, do you want to start uh, and just give us a career highlight? Well, there's lots of highlights, but uh, I guess uh, I, uh, I, I, moving from uh, theater proper and dance, I've, I've started to work uh, with uh, people writing prose, so working with Jeff Prohl on uh, towards uh, dramaturgical sensibility, working with him on that project over probably three years, and that moved into his, uh, he's in the middle of writing a novel, and I'm working with him on a, as a dramaturg on that novel, so all day Sunday we've devoted to my notes on that, and then later we'll be going to Liz Engelman's Hangout uh, <laughs> later in the month, and working for a week on the a novel there. So that's a, that's a really long-term, uh, very engaging uh, dramaturgical relationship. Wonderful, thank you. I don't really have any long-term things on the horizon. I kind of feel like I'm, I'm living my best life right now with every, with the combination of things that I'm doing and getting to do and in terms of working with people um, between my work at the field and my work at the Classical Theater of Harlem and the American Slavery Project, I just feel like every day is a, a new variety of something to get into, but what I am really enjoying the most right now is that my work um, uh, helping other artists sustain their creative lives is really important to me. Um, and the exchange with that is, is great. I mean, just giving and getting back and people call you later and it leads to something else is, is what you want. Like, so I don't really, I don't know if that answers the question. No, I think it's about a career <laughs> highlight. It sounds like you're in your career. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing pretty good here. You're living it. I want to speak to short-term gigs, because I, I got hired by somebody recently. She was an established writer. I find it easier to work with more established people. I think they're more realistic and respectful. And she was a playwright, but she was moving into, into film. and. She had a studio pitch and she had to do it over the phone because a lot of times I don't want to spend money now to fly you out for a meeting. And she just wanted to rehearse what she was going to say on the phone and give me money, you know, which I do for free with friends all the time. So I love that. You know, I sat with her. She pitched, pitched the project. It ended up being dramaturgical because I said, you know what, I'm getting lost here or, you know, you've repeated here or how is that the through line? It ended up being dram dramaturgical, but it wasn't set up that way. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say in terms of like career highlights, um, when I had the job at the taper under Showtime, one of the things that I liked about it was that they expected that we would work with artists from different disciplines and at different points in their life and bring in novel directors, bring in novel actors. Um, I worked with, and I'm not saying this to boast at all because it was before he, 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 he actually, you know, he, he became so hot, but I worked with Don Cheadle on a project where um, he had written a play in this developmental lab called Blacksmiths, which was for African American theater artists, and he wanted to make it into a film. Because of who he was, I didn't have a problem setting it up at Showtime. I had a small discretionary fund, which I realize is a complete luxury. But I gave him notes on how to do a rewrite. It was very clear, as brilliant a man as he is, he is an actor and now an actor-director. He was not going to sit by himself in a room and rewrite it. So he had written a play for four of his friends in a hotel room right before one of them gets married. And so what I did was I said, okay, we're going up, you know, we're going to work with your original actor friends. We're going to the hotel room. You're going to have a camera. You're going to shoot them as they do stuff. And you're going to figure out how to do the rewrite that way. And, and it worked. So, you know, some of it is sort of figuring out how it is if you're working with an untraditional artist, um, how, to, how to figure out how to, how to present the notes or bring the best work out of them. Um, and I, I think of that as a highlight. Again, not because he's a superstar, but because I felt like my creative contribution was figuring out how to get his best work out of him. Thank you. Um, 
I've been very fortunate and I have a lot of highlights that I'd love to tell you about and some funny stories. So um, I think uh, one, I'm gonna say two, two highlights. So an old one is doing a, a Doors musical at San Diego Rep called Celebration of the Lizard with Ray Manzarek as one of our co-producers. And um, in a workshop, we, did, we had Billy Zane playing our stranger, and it was a post-apocalyptic LA story. <laughs> and using the lyrics of Jim Morrison's songs as the text. And finally, we said, well, we gotta add a little more in between <laughs> because it's a little bit of a drug trip, epic poem play. So, uh, and uh, Grace Jones was our queen, uh, our lizard queen. And uh, so <laughs> that was the most fantastic workshop probably I've ever done with Grace coming in with her cape on. And she had, she always had shrimp for lunch in this silver bowl and she had a <laughs> bottle of champagne and a driver. And <laughs> we're in this little weird rehearsal hall in what was then uh, part of San Diego that wasn't very wealthy. And it was quite hilarious. But um, in my, career. I adore working with my playwright, Marcus Gardley. We've done about 10 collaborations. Um, and I actually will talk about a recent um, highlight was one of the first times I was called a co-collaborator in the writing of the play. It was uh, Margot Hall's and Marcus Shelby's Bebop Baby, a musical memoir in at Z Space this past year. Um, and uh, they, and I w it was written by Margot Hall in collaboration with Nikisa Edamod and also dramaturgy by Nikisa Edamod. So it was very wonderful to be a co-creator and not just a dramaturg. And I was helping, she's a famous actress in the Bay Area and helping her learn how to write her own story and um, to have top billing that way too and be on the poster with them uh, we, and having the two names, my husband actually bought the huge bus side from <laughs> because he was excited my name was on there. You're getting credit! Yay, dramaturgs! <laughs> so he had it framed and it's in my living room. <laughs> but, uh, so that, that was a really wonderful recent highlight. Thank you, Nikisa. And I'm glad you got that credit as co-creator okay. too. It's important. Um, I have a couple career highlights too, but I'm only gonna give you one brief one, which was um, from a conference that I'm a frequent guest artist at in uh, Valdez, Alaska. It's called the Last Frontier Theater Conference. I met, this is quite a few years ago, about seven years ago, I met the state's uh, writer laureate, and her name is Ann Hanley, and she was in the very, very beginning uh, stages of writing a piece about uh, the Athabascan Indians, and it was spurred from uh, the fact that in Alaska there is so much teen suicide in the male teen boys community. It's an epidemic, and it's really an epidemic. So the play was such in such an early stage. It we developed it, and um, it was an amazing. It's where one of those things where I think journey, that word I really don't like applied and it's touring currently into uh, the bush and I have had the opportunity to fly into tiny towns of 150 people where absolutely everybody has a brother, an uncle, a son who has taken their own life. And in the course of trying to find out how to shape the piece, because these families get a lot of talk about don't commit suicide, it's a really bad thing to do. And that doesn't really, <laughs> helped them a lot. And so the writer developed a character who was exactly their age. We played music that was their age. There was a video element developed because the kid was stuck on his video. And I believe that it has changed some, at least one life that I know of. So that was a career highlight for me. And it did show that theater can really change the world. And we know that. So. Thank you all for being such a great audience. Thank you for coming and thank you to my really esteemed colleagues up here tonight. Thanks, have a great rest of the conference. Okay, you have 15 minutes, go to the bathroom, come back here from some critics.